when I think of 45 years, nine times five, Dr. Bollinger writes the number nine is a most remarkable number in many respects. It is held in great reverence by all who study the occult sciences. And in mathematical science, it possesses properties and powers now, we wouldn't say possesses, but we'd say it has properties and powers which are found in no other number. He has a footnote here. Among others may be mentioned that the sum of the digits which form its multiples are themselves always a multiple of nine. See, there's a completeness to it, a compact completeness to it. And for instance, he says, 2 times 9 equal 18, and take those digits, 1 plus 8 equals what? 9. 3 times 9 equals 27. What's 2 plus 7? 9. 4 times 9 is 36. What's 3 plus 6? 9, and on and on. Well, let's go to 5 times 9 equals 45, and what's 4 plus 5? <laughs> Now, if that's not godly design, like the old codgers would say, I'll put in with you. If that ain't godly design, I'll put in with you. I'll be as stupid as you want to act if you think this whole world was made by accident. They explain everything in a way by, oh, well, it was just millions and millions and millions of years of development and evolution. Boy, what a cop-out. See, you can find Almighty God in the precision of numbers if your heart is hungry enough. You can find Almighty God in the precision of numbers. And without the precision of numbers, we wouldn't be talking on these mobile phones bouncing beams off of satellites, which none of us really understand, and yet here we are enjoying it. I don't understand it either, except God put all the properties in his universe where these inventions could be discovered. And it is remarkable. It's incredible. But they want to give themselves credit. Why not give, instead of Steve Jobs, let's give Jehovah Elohim a little credit, huh? Sure, these were brilliant men that developed a lot of this stuff, like that Rich guy that gives away all the charity and they think he's so wonderful. But it's about a tenth of a tenth of a hundredth percent of what he has. Oh, that guy who plays golf looks like a nerd. I can't think of his name. But who cares? Um, yeah, okay, these men developed it. Henry Ford and the automobile, the combustible combustible engine. Um, all um, Thomas Edison, that you got to admire these guys, inventors, Franklin with his stove, etc. Others, of course, many, many others. And yet, let's give a little credit to Jehovah Elohim that put all the variables in this second heaven and earth that these things could be discovered. Isaac Newton might have first recognized gravity, but he didn't put the planets up there in perfect orbits, bouncing their impacts off of each other so that gravity could have such a perfect ideal effect on a human habitation of Earth. He didn't do that, but he discovered a lot about it. Thankful for that, but let's give some credit to the Creator. How about it? But he's always the one most forgotten, isn't he, except for a few of us. You know, Isaac Newton might have discovered the point of gravity. But look at all the orbital arrangements of stars and planets that have to be so perfectly synchronized for the gravity not to crush our skulls, for the gravity not to reduce our bone structure to dust. Why is it that Jupiter is the fifth planet from the Earth as the righteous star of his star and protects us from the eruptions, the belches, the farts of Saturn. 
that keeps all that crap. How many times would the earth have been destroyed if Jupiter wasn't running interference in its concatenations right in front of Saturn, keeping Saturn's vicious, satanic explosions from annihilating our habitation? How many times has Jupiter, that huge planet, protected us from the blow-ups of Saturn. See, there's a spiritual lesson in there. Saturn is the planet associated with Satan. Jupiter is his star, the king star, the king of righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ that the Magi observed in conjunction in the constellation Leo, the lion of the tribe of Judah that signaled them that a Messiah would be born and then was born, and then they made their journey and saw the young child in a house with his mother a, approximately a year and three or four months, or no, was it nine months? Nine months to a year after the birth, actually. Jupiter protecting us from the devastations of the satanic representation of Saturn. Who did all that? Well, let's get back to numbers. The number nine, I'll drop down here, marks the completeness, the end and issue of all things as to man, the judgment of man and all his works. It's a number of finality. Another way I've seen it stated, it's the last word on a subject. You know, there's nine manifestations. There's not ten. There's nine fruit of the Spirit, not ten or eleven. Another phrase here from Bollinger, it is stamped, therefore, with the numbers of grace and finality. Well, that's a blessing in the nine times four equation, which blessed me in my thoughts these recent days I thought I'd share with you. Well, we're going to pick up after the break here in a few minutes with the third step downward. In 2 Timothy 3, 8, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. This is the third step downward. Remember, with quick review, in chapter 1, verse 15 is the first downward step of the, to the church in ruin, this thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Well, I remember when Dr. Earl taught this way back in 1974-75, he said, that doesn't mean the way he ate his hamburger. <laughs> turned away from his teaching, turned away from the revelation of the great mystery, which obviously implies falling prey to fragmentations and the bewitchings of legalism. And he names these two rotten thread seed of the serpenters, of whom are Phygelus, meaning fugitive, and Hermogenes, a false messenger. And we've dealt with that in some detail. The second step down is in chapter 2, in verse 17, and their word will eat or spread, as doth a canker, a gangrene, of whom? Names two more seed men is Hymenaeus, rotten thread, and Philetus, rotten thread. Hymenaeus, the god of marriage, emphasizes family relationships above the word. Philetus means amiable, friendly, which emphasizes friendship above the truth, who concerning the truth of erred. See, error, first it's doctrinal in 115. Here it's practical in their lifestyle, in their walk. They emphasize family and friend above the truth of the word, saying that the resurrection is past. I believe the original text could very well read, saying that resurrection power is past already and overthrow the believing of some, which is complete documentation of denominational Christianity for the most part in our day in which all the manifestations are ignored, and most especially speaking in tongues, because they declare that it's unnecessary for various idiotic, fragmented sense knowledge reasons. 
Then the third step downward is where they resist the truth. And that's where we'll pick up after 10 minutes here. Thank you. All right. Bless your hearts. Uh, I'd like to look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I, if you have your literals of Timothy, Dr. Orwell's literals, first I want to read the King James Version in 1 Timothy at the end of chapter 5. Remember, 1 Timothy is the church in reign. And we have this great truth that is set forth. Some men's sins, we're talking leadership here, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. In other words, you judge them properly by the word. You discern their treachery and you clean up, clean things up. And some men, they follow after also. Likewise, the good works also of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. You don't see right away with some people the greatness of their lives and their ministries. It might come down the line, like in a remnant situation. Ha <laughs> ha. Dr. Werewolf's great literal. Some men are notoriously unfit, but the unfitness of others is not manifest until they are tried. Now, see, right there is the reason why these seed of the serpent, insidious, deceitful ones, are able to creep in unawares, like it says in Jude. You know, when you find this out later, It's just human nature. I've been through the same thing. Why the heck didn't I see that before? Why couldn't I have gotten rid of this evil element before? But that's not the way life works. They are adept at hiding. They are adept at infiltration. It says in Psalm 10, 9, and 10 that as a lion crouches in the grass, these lions, they're their hides, their skin tone, so to speak, blends in with the grasses of the veldt, and they use the natural environment to camouflage themselves. Well, that's a perfect example of the adversary. He adapts his methods to the day and time. And as I look back over 45 years of ordination, and of course a few more than that being part of the great ministry of the way, as it was, I can recognize infiltrations. I can recognize now treacheries, or at the time, I didn't see it as such, and I can recognize many as candidates that the unfitness of others is not manifest until they are tried, until crisis points arise where true colors emerge, where people you thought you could trust with the word, trust with your heart, prove themselves unfit, and then others rise up. Because in verse 25, likewise, the good works of some are evident immediately, while the good works of others cannot remain hidden indefinitely. And I believe that's a wonderful testimony on our season of the remnant that we are developing and enjoying here. That so many capabilities of ministering and handling the word properly emerge that were not evident previous years. This is why, from the devilish point of view, This is why Philetus, or let's start with Phygelus and Hermogenes, and then Hymenaeus and Philetus, infiltrated. This is why then, after they have turned themselves away from the great doctrine of the revelation of the mystery, turned away from Paul's revelations, Then they practice error. They fall into the error of Hymenaeus and Philetus who provided 
activities and and lesser priorities made to look like the priority, appealing to human impulse, human nature, rather than the uh, the new nature. And these horizontal parts of the creation became what they worshipped. Like it says in Romans 1.25, they worshipped and served the creation, not the creator. And that, of course, is the basis of all idolatry. To take some aspect of God's creation and turn that in to a first cause, a righteous cause, a priority cause of life. And obviously, there's millions of ways to go that route to deny the one true God. But this is how they crept in. 